In this video, we're going to take a look at graphical summaries of data, and we're going to be focusing on qualitative data for this video. Uh, and the next one, we'll look at quantitative data, um, which we have to treat a little bit differently. So the idea uh, of a graphical summary of data is it's going to be much easier to quickly uh, interpret what a data set is telling us if we have a good way of presenting it. Um, if I just give you a big long list of numbers or a big long list of words uh, out of a, a table or a data set that we've collected, looking at that list isn't going to be something that you can immediately interpret. But if you look at a graph, a picture of the data, we're going to be able to make quicker decisions and quicker interpretations of what it's telling us. So that's kind of the point here. Uh, graphs can tell us um, about the nature of a data set really quickly. So quickly and efficiently. So let's take a look at an example to kind of demonstrate this. Um, <clears throat> let's imagine that uh, an ice cream shop is trying to determine how much of each flavor they want to keep in stock um, so that they can meet customer, customer demand. They don't have too much of one flavor and too little of another flavor. So an ice cream shop... wants to uh, stock their flavors based on customer demand. So how would we go about doing this? If we were either the owners of the ice cream shop or we were hired to help them, how would we go about doing something like this? The first thing we'd want to do uh, is figure out what customer demand looks like. So this would require taking a sample. And that's what we focused on in um, the previous chapter, in chapter one. So we would want to take some sort of sample. How could we do this? Um, one idea is maybe we just take a look at um, the last hundred people to, to order. Um, to order ice cream, and we could see what their orders looked like, or maybe the last 1,000 people. We could do a random sample. Um, in this case, let's just keep it easy. Let's say, um, let's just say they, they record the last, I don't know, 100 sales, and they get the following list of data. So, um, they'll have the customer and we'll have the flavor. Uh, and maybe we wind up with a big long list. Again, I won't write their names. We'll just say customer one, customer two, customer three, customer four, customer five, so on and so forth, all the way down the list, down to the hundredth customer. And maybe to make things easy, let's say the shop only sells a few flavors. They've got strawberry, vanilla, or chocolate. Uh, and so the first, the first customer ordered vanilla, and then the second one ordered chocolate, the third one ordered chocolate, then there was a strawberry, then a vanilla. Last order, or the last customer ordered chocolate. So we just get a big long list, and these again represent uh, flavors. This one's vanilla, chocolate. And this one down here is strawberry. So if I just gave you a list of 100 V's, C's, and S's, we're not going to be able to really interpret what that list is telling us very quickly. So this is hard to read.
And it only gets worse as the list gets longer. If I give you a list of a thousand letters V, C, and S, we're not going to be able to interpret what it's telling us very quickly. Instead, we will want to create uh, or one option of something we can create is something called a frequency distribution. So let's start with that. So frequency distribution for our data here. OK. Let me give you a couple of quick definitions, and then we will take a look at what the frequency distribution actually looks like. So the first thing I want to define is the word frequency in the context of this class. Um, the frequency of a category of qualitative data, so frequency is the word we're defining, uh, the frequency of a category is simply the number of times that it occurs in the data set. And a frequency distribution which is the other thing we're about to actually create, a frequency distribution, oh, come on now, frequency distribution is just a table uh, that presents this frequency data. So it's just a table presenting frequency data. So for the example that we uh, just took a look at up here with our different flavors of ice cream, um, the frequency distribution for this, instead of keeping track of the individual customers, that's not necessary. I don't care which customer ordered which flavor. I just want to know the total number of customers that ordered vanilla and the total number that ordered chocolate and the total number that ordered strawberry. And so we can create our frequency distribution by just keeping track of those values. We say, for example, that we list the flavor. There's the category we're interested in. And we list the frequency, which I may uh, <clears throat> abbreviate as just F-R-E-Q going forward. So we've got vanilla, we've got chocolate, and we've got strawberry. And let's say out of those 100 people, 27 ordered vanilla, 43 ordered chocolate, and 30 ordered strawberry. Now instead of a list of 100 S's, V's, and C's, I've got a list of three things, and each one just has a number associated with it. And I can immediately see that chocolate was the most popular, vanilla was the least popular, but vanilla and strawberry were really, really close in terms of how frequently they were, they were ordered. Um, <clears throat> Another thing that we might be interested in is what's called the relative frequency. Uh, the relative frequency, instead of just telling you that 43 people ordered chocolate, I want to tell you what percentage or, uh, of people ordered chocolate or what proportion of people ordered chocolate. So the relative frequency is given by the following. We just take, so let me abbreviate it here, relative frequency. And it's just going to be equal to the frequency of that given category divided by the total number of observations. So basically our sample size. And in the example above, we already said how many there were, but we can take the total of these, add up all the frequencies. So if, we, if it hadn't told us that we were sampling 100 customers, we could just add these up to see how many total people were sampled. And you'd add them up and see, oh, sure enough, 100 people. So 
<clears throat> it's really easy in this table uh, to figure out what the relative frequency would be. And if I add a column for that, so let me do it in a different color here. If I add this blue column for the relative frequency, then this thing becomes what's known as a relative frequency distribution instead of just a regular frequency distribution. So frequency distribution just has the first two columns. A relative frequency distribution would have this third column attached to it as well. So relative frequency distribution. And in this case, I just take the frequency and divide by the total number of observations. And in this case, it's easy because the total number of observations was 100. We can probably figure out these percentages without having, we can hopefully do some of these calculations in our head. 27 out of 100 is literally 27%, but we will write it as a proportion, 0 0.27. And similarly, we've got 43 out of 100, which is going to be 0 0.43. That is the decimal equivalent of 43%, or the proportion. And then if we do 30 out of 100, we get 0 0.3 or 0 0.30, but we can leave off that last zero if we want. So frequency distributions are just tables, tables presenting the data, and they're really quick and easy to interpret. But in addition to tables, we're also going to want to use graphs. So I'm going to go through some of the different types of graphs and charts that we might use to um, view data. So we've got our frequency distribution, but what about graphs and charts? Um, hopefully these are things that you're familiar with, that you've at least heard of. We're going to be talking about bar graphs and pie charts, uh, and there will be one or two terms that will probably be new to you that you might not have heard before, unless you've taken a statistics class before. So the first one I want to talk about, this is going to be one of the most common ones that we're going to deal with, is just a simple bar graph. And a bar graph for our, uh, our data, we start off with a vertical and a horizontal axis, kind of like the x and y axis if you were doing a graph in like an algebra class, same type of thing. But we just draw it as kind of a big L shape. And uh, we can write down here our category. I'm gonna put the flavors down along this side, along the horizontal part. And on this side, I'm gonna put the frequency. Uh, and our flavors were, um, I don't remember, vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. I'll just abbreviate them that way. And for the frequency, if we go back up here, we can see the highest frequency we had was 43. So I need this vertical one to go up to at least 43. To make my life easy, I'm just going to count by tens and say I'm going to go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And so I'll label those. There's. Let me zoom back in. Good enough. So 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. And we just draw a bar corresponding to each flavor whose height corresponds to the frequency from that table up there. So we said for vanilla, there were 27 orders. The bar for vanilla is going to go up to a height of, I'm going to ballpark at 27. That's a little below the 30 here. So there's vanilla. For chocolate, we said it was 43. Needs to go up to, there's 40-ish, 43 is going to be a little bit higher. So that has a height of 43, right? So the idea is the height of the bar corresponds to the frequency. And strawberry was right at 30. So if I draw that one, it's a little bit taller than the one for vanilla. And it would come all the way out to here. Okay, so that's where we get the height. So you don't need to draw these little dotted lines that I just put in. You would just draw the bars. Um, those dotted lines are just meant to be an indication of how I'm determining the heights of these. Hopefully that's fairly intuitive. Um, there's all a, a bunch of variations on this. So there's uh, we could do a horizontal bar graph. And the only difference is it's basically the graph we just drew but tipped on its side. Uh, and we do that by switching the role 
of what goes on the horizontal axis and what goes on the vertical axis. So instead of the flavors down here and the frequency up here, I'd put the flavors up here and the frequency down here. So we'll do that really quickly. And I'm not going to draw these in nearly as carefully, but we would have, again, frequency down here. And we'd have the flavors up here. And we would have our vanilla and our chocolate and our strawberry. And the bars would go out horizontally instead. And Again, I'm just ballparking these just to give you a general idea of the shape. Again, the heights of these bars would need to correspond to the frequencies. I'd need to put in the different values here. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Maybe I made that bar a little too big. Something like that. So there's our 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. So we'd include those labels. The point is we just want this graph to be something that's readable. Um, this can sometimes be a, a horizontal one, can sometimes be a good option if you have a lot of categories. Um, and especially if you're planning on displaying it like online on a website or something, because it's much easier to scroll um, up and down on a website than it is side to side. So you could see a long list of flavors and just kind of scroll up and down. Uh, and that would be a reason that you might want to do a horizontal one. But it's basically just sort of common sense or practical purposes of why you would pick one over the other. There's or 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 matter of preference, honestly. Um, the next type of graph that you might not have heard of is called a Pareto graph. It is another variation on a bar graph. A Pareto graph is just a sorted bar graph. So basically we take the heights of the bars and we sort them either from um, shortest to tallest or tallest to shortest. So we uh, are sorting from lowest frequency to highest frequency or vice versa. Doesn't matter. Both of those are referred to as Pareto graphs. So in this case, it'd be the same picture that we just had. Uh, above, we'd have our flavors, we'd have our frequency. I also should mention I picked 50 just to make my life easy. Um, and I'm counting by tens, but you could totally count by fives if that was more convenient or count by twenties and have it go to 60 instead. It's just a matter of preference. Uh, you want the data to be clear and readable. Um, but that is somewhat subjective, so I'm not going to like mark you off if you do one of these with different labels on the frequency axis than the labels that I picked or something like that. Um, in this case, though, the Pareto graph to be sorted, I'm going to do largest to smallest, so let's go up and just recall real quickly. Our flavors went in order of popularity. Chocolate was the most popular, then strawberry, then vanilla. So I, I would need to reflect that in the chart here. Chocolate, then strawberry, then vanilla. And what we'd see is our graph would go from the tallest down to the shortest. And again, this can be really nice if you have a lot of different categories. If, if this was Baskin Robbins and we had 31 flavors instead, this might, might be nice to use because it's much easier to compare um, values that are similar to each other when it's sorted and they would be sitting right next to each other on a graph. You can imagine if I just had them um, displayed randomly or alphabetically or by some other weird way of sorting them uh, and the heights were just random all over the place. If I had two bars that were really similar, kind of like these two, the vanilla and the strawberry, but they were separated. One was over here and one was way across the page over on the right side. It'd be really hard to tell which one was taller and which one was shorter when they were separated by that much. But if I sort them, they'll show up right next to each other on the graph and it'll be really obvious, oh, strawberry is just a little bit more popular than vanilla. So that's a reason that you might want to use a Pareto graph. Um, The last one I'll mention is what's often referred to as a side-by-side -side bar graph. And these graphs um, allow us to display even more data than a normal bar graph. So it would 
look similar to the original bar graph. I'm going to give myself a little more room because now I'll have my flavors down here. I'll have my frequency over here. Um, but maybe our data is a little bit different. Maybe we have more data that we collected. Um, maybe our ice cream shop is a, you know sells a seasonal product. Obviously, ice cream is a seasonal product. It's more popular in the summertime and less popular in the wintertime. Uh, and so maybe we want to keep track of what the sales look like season by season. That way they don't overstock accidentally in the in the winter by ordering the same amount of ice cream that they order in the summer and it just sits there. Uh, so maybe we want to compare the, we've got our whatever flavors, vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. It doesn't need to be sorted anymore. But maybe we have two. Maybe it turns out that in the summertime, uh, we've got that vanilla was 27 sales in a day. Um, but in the wintertime, that drops down to only like 15 sales. And for chocolate, it was at 43 sales per day. And maybe in the wintertime, that drops down to 30 sales a day. And strawberry, maybe it takes the biggest hit of all. It goes from 30, um, but people don't want the fruity flavor, and it drops all the way down to only 10 sales a day in the wintertime. And we would differentiate these by doing some sort of, we can either shade it, maybe I can do it in a different color, where we can say, okay, the white bars represent summertime, and the red bars represent wintertime, and we'd have, have to have some sort of, oops, some sort of key or legend, like a legend on a map, to indicate the difference between these. And it would say, oh, this is, you know, maybe this was in July, and this one is in December or January or something like that. And now we can keep track of more data. And you could have even more than just two categories. Maybe we would have uh, all 12 months, or maybe we would do winter, spring, summer, and fall and have four bars each. The idea is we just want to present data as clearly and easily readable as possible, something that we can look at and immediately interpret what it's telling us. Um, <clears throat> one other point I want to emphasize while we're talking about these graphs and charts is I'm hand drawing all of these right now. In reality, you would never want to hand draw a bar graph, right? If you worked at a job where you were required to actually produce some sort of graphs, you would want to use computer software. You would use Excel. There's a ton of other uh, resources available to generate these types of graphs. And it's going to look much more professional, much more exact, much cleaner, much easier to read. So just keep that in mind. We're drawing these to demonstrate the concept, but the reality is if you ever needed to produce one of these for any sort of professional setting, Right. If it's your job to come in and talk to the CEO of your company and say, here's our, you know, justify why our branch should stay open. Here's our, here's our sales compared to the other ones. Don't come in with hand-drawn graphs. Come in with professionally produced graphs using computer software. I'm just illustrating the ideas. We're not going to focus a ton on, on drawing graphs. I want you to be able to interpret graphs. That's what we're focusing on now. Um, another type of graph or chart is going to be a pie chart, which is, again, hopefully something that you are all familiar with. I'm sure you've all seen pie charts at some point. Um, <clears throat> they are circular. Almost. Good enough. I can live with that circle. Uh, and we would see, in this case... Um, the idea is you draw it, and they sort of look like sections of pi. Uh, if I wanted to draw the sections related to the data that we had above for ice cream, um, we would just section it up and say, okay, so if I'm trying to do chocolate. It was 43 out of the 100, so that's 43%. That's going to be a little bit less than half. And then the remaining two pieces 
One's a little bit bigger than the other. And so maybe we would say that this is chocolate, this one's strawberry, this one's vanilla. And we would even probably want to put those numbers in. We would want to say this represents 43% of sales. And this represented 30% of sales. And this re represented 27%. Where am I getting these percents? The percents are the same as the relative frequency way back from up here in the video, right? We wrote them as decimals, but we could have written them as percents. 0.27 is the same as 27%. It's 27 out of 100. That's what the word percent means. Per, like just normal and plain English, out of is what per means. And cent, think of like a cent, a penny, or a century, 100 years. Cent is the Latin root for the word 100. So 27 per 100 is what 27 percent means. Here it is as a decimal. Here's where we write it with the percent symbol. Um, so here's the picture of that pie chart. We might distinguish these also with, you know, different shading and different colors. That would be a totally reasonable thing to do. Uh, different colors. And the same same type of thing could happen where we maybe want to have, um, just keeping in mind, what if hypothetically we, at, at our ice cream shop, we had one guy that came in every day, one old guy, and he always requested black licorice flavored ice cream. And so we kept our special stock just for him. And that accounted for, you know, 1% of our sales because every day he comes in and orders his black licorice ice cream and nobody else ever gets it. Well, now if I wanted to try to sneak in that one little percent sliver, I don't have room to write in the sliver the, the way that I did with these other ones. I can't put the, the letter or the name of the flavor and the percentage in there. So how do we deal with that? Well, in that case, uh, we maybe would want to color code it again. And we could do it, you know, a different color and put a, a legend or table out on the side. But the other thing that we might do is something where we just have like a little thing that shoots out and it says, here's the black licorice ice cream. And it's only 1% of sales. Um, and I know those don't add up to 100 anymore. So maybe hypothetically, let me change one of these to what's going to be the easiest one to change. 20 six now let's say he used to be a vanilla eater now he gets his black licorice the point of drawing it like this is just to show you you can label these sections um, even if you don't have room to label it within it use some sort of little line to come out and say here's the vanilla here's the chocolate right, whatever is the the case whatever's going to make it readable or again have a big legend over on the side with all of the different colors and all of the different flavors, where this is chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, and black licorice, and we shade them in appropriately to vanilla. Which one did I just do? Blue is strawberry, green was vanilla, and yellow was this black licorice one. We could do a table like that. The main uh, other thing that I want to point out in all of this, now that we're kind of looking at all of these, is that in general, pie charts, notice that the information that we put into these, they're all the percentages. These are relative frequencies. So generally, bar graphs generally display, sorry, pie charts generally display relative frequency. Whereas bar graphs generally display, but not always, you can have ones that show relative frequency as well. But these generally, this is what we would use if we wanted to display um, frequency data rather than relative frequency. Um, <clears throat> and the idea is that's because that's really kind of the point of this. This circle rep represents the whole 100%. And we're really interested in how is that 100% divvied up? What proportion of sales went towards chocolate or vanilla or strawberry, or in this case, black licorice, right? We want to deal with relative frequency in that case. Whereas bar graphs, the height of the bar actually typically uh, 
is related to the frequency, and we can see the actual total volume, but we, it's harder to see which proportion. I can see chocolate was the most, but I don't know exactly how much more it was than strawberry or vanilla or things like that. So keep that in mind. The purpose of bar graphs and pie charts um, differ. One other thing that is possibly worth mentioning here as I come back down to here is, <clears throat> again, uh, you want to use a computer to draw this, but if we were to need to figure out exactly how big a section should be, so how big should one of these sections be? We would have to convert uh, from our relative frequency to degrees, right? Because degrees are what we use to measure sort of an angle, uh, which is what we would use to measure what a, a section of, the, of one of these circles. So if you keep in mind, a full circle is how many degrees? Hopefully this is a number you remember. It's used all the time. Full circle is 360 degrees. A full rotation would be we started pointing up, went all the way around back to pointing up, 360 degrees. So if I want to know number of degrees for uh, a given section, all I need to do is take the relative frequency. So for example, 43%. And I need to multiply that by uh, 360 degrees. So for chocolate, the number of degrees for the chocolate, I would take its relative frequency and I would take the decimal version, 0 0.43, not 43%. I wouldn't do the number 43 here. I would do 0 0.43 because it's going to be less than 1 because it's going to be less than the 360 degrees. I need the number to get smaller when I multiply. And I'd multiply times my 360 degrees. Uh, and when I do that, so let me just grab a calculator real quickly. And that turns out to be 154.8 degrees. Or, you know, I can't tell visually the difference between 154.8 and 155, so you could certainly round that to the nearest degree if you'd wanted. So, uh, again, pie charts are meant to tell us sort of the proportion of total sales in this case. So it's a proportion or the relative frequency. Um, one other word that you will encounter uh, that I don't want to spend a ton of time on is something called an ogive graph or an ogive chart. And these tend to display the exact same type of data as like a bar graph. Um, but instead of bars, we might use just individual points. Maybe here's the data. So we'd have our, um, our category down here, and we'd have our frequency over here, and we'd have maybe you know, a bunch of dots, and we would play, basically just connect the dots with these. So like, you know, if you ever watch the commercials with, you know, something showing the stock market and it shows like, oh, and then it shows it shooting off through the roof or whatever, that's what's known as an ogive chart. You'd put it together, basically you construct it in the same way you construct a bar graph. This is not going to be something that I focus on, but you will see these in the book. So just as a heads up, um, keep this in mind. An ogive chart is basically a connected bar graph. You plot the heights and the centers of these dots occur right above whatever category you're interested in or whatever number you wind up needing. So, so on and so forth. It looks something like that. So just keep that kind in, uh, in mind as well. Um, and this should be pretty much everything you need. Again, I'm not going to force you to draw a bunch of these types of graphs by hand. If you ever wanted to draw one, you would use Excel or something like that to make much prettier graphs. Um, but conceptually, I want you to be able to see a graph like one of these and interpret, read the information from it, and quickly interpret what it's telling us.
that's really the goal of this section.